Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, still in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. You no doubt realize by now that great speakers and speeches will remain fully online during the fall semester. So I am preparing a video version of each lecture for the class and making all the lessons available on YouTube. Enjoy the lecture. So next we turn to President Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural address from March the 4th, 1933. And this will be the first of the speeches that we're studying this semester for which we have both film and audio recording. So when we get to the excerpts of the speech, we'll let Roosevelt speak for himself. Franklin Roosevelt was born on the 30th of January in 1882 he was born into a wealthy family in Hyde Park, New York. He was actually the fifth cousin of President Theodore Roosevelt. And in his youth, he was mostly homeschooled and also traveled frequently to Europe with his family. In 1896, he entered Groton Boarding School in Massachusetts. And in 1903, he graduated from Harvard College. The following year, he entered Columbia University Law School and became a lawyer. In 1905, he married another fifth cousin, Eleanor Roosevelt. In 1910, Franklin Roosevelt was elected to his first public office, that in the New York State Senate. In 1913, he was appointed by President Woodrow Wilson to be the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. In 1914, Franklin Roosevelt ran for United States Senate, but was defeated in the Democratic primary in New York. In 1917, the United States joined World War I, and Roosevelt was still Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the war. And in 1918, he traveled to Europe on a naval inspection tour. But on the return voyage from Europe, he contracted Spanish influenza, which was the last great pandemic. He survived, but many other people on the voyage did not. In 1920, he was nominated as the vice presidential candidate to run with James Cox, who was a governor from Ohio. But the ticket lost to the Republican ticket of Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge. In 1921, Roosevelt was stricken with polio and it crippled him. He remained unable to walk without assistance for the rest of his life. In 1928, he was elected governor of New York and the following year, the Great Depression began. There was the 1929 stock market crash in October. That was followed by bank failures, record high unemployment as much as 25%, and also many farm and even home foreclosures. In 1930, he was reelected as the Democratic governor of the state of New York. And in 1932, he was elected the 32nd president of the United States. The election took place in November of 32, and the inauguration would be on the 4th of March. But while he was visiting Miami between the time of his election and his inauguration, he survived an assassination attempt. So our task here today is to examine Roosevelt's first inaugural address, the first of four. He was the only president to be elected and to serve four terms as president of the United States. And we can begin by asking about the genre, the exigence, the audience, and the constraints. Now, we've talked about presidential inaugurals before, they are more generally speaking within the epideictic genre, but it's also clear, and especially by 1933, there was a well-established tradition of presidential inaugurals. And Roosevelt is obviously participating in that long generic tradition. So what is the exigence? By March of 1933, the United States, and indeed the whole world, had been suffering in the Great Depression for about three and a half years. And so Roosevelt's first task is to address the concerns related to the economic collapse in the United States. 
There's also something of an emotional exigence insofar as Roosevelt wants to establish confidence in the American economy and give the American people that feeling that there's something worthwhile to work for in the future. So who is his audience? Obviously, Roosevelt is speaking not only to the people assembled at the Capitol for the inauguration, but indeed to all Americans. This would have been an inaugural address that was heard on the radio throughout the country. And you can imagine that perhaps your great-grandparents and your grandparents when they were young were gathered around the radio in their family homes listening to what the new president would have to say. And as is the case with any presidential inaugural, there's also obviously an international audience looking for clues about what the new presidential administration might do with regard to foreign affairs or even domestic economic affairs. So what are the constraints here? Well, first, we talked about the genre of presidential inaugurals. So there are then constraints that come from the expectations people have about what new presidents ought to say upon taking office. There is that generic constraint or generic traditions associated with the genre of presidential inaugurals. But there's also obviously the constraints that come from the difficult circumstances that Roosevelt faces. And you'll see several places in the speech where he addresses those circumstances. He identifies them and names them, describes what those conditions are as part of the rhetorical situation and indeed the political and economic situation that he faces as a new president. And those constraints also help to determine what he is going to say in this situation. So he's looking for and chooses certain strategies, certain images, a certain approach to his inaugural, which will respond especially to the feelings that Americans have while they're suffering in the midst of the Great Depression. So here are some other critical questions related to the first inaugural of Franklin Roosevelt. How does the speech adhere to that traditional inaugural form? And again, we've seen a couple of inaugurals already. We had the Jefferson inaugural from 1801 and the Lincoln second inaugural from 1865. We talked about how the Lincoln speech really was quite distinct from most other inaugurals. But then we can look at the Roosevelt speech and see how maybe some of those more traditional themes that we saw in the Jefferson speech are also in evidence in Roosevelt's address. And then what are the key emotional elements of the speech? Perhaps the most famous line of the speech talks about fear. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And fear is obviously an emotion. But if we go back to Aristotle and look at what Aristotle said about fear as an element of rhetorical pathos, he always talked about the emotions in pairs and in opposites. And the opposite of fear is confidence. And so we want to look closely at the way in which Roosevelt manages that emotional balance between fear and confidence. And we can also look at some of the other emotional elements in the speech. And then what are the chief figurative or metaphoric images in the address? And we'll look a little more closely at this when we look at the article by Suzanne Doughton where she talks about especially the religious metaphors and the military metaphors used by Roosevelt. And that brings up then this next question, what are the main religious themes in the address? You'll see several places in Roosevelt's inaugural where he quotes directly or paraphrases from verses of the Bible. And so we can ask, why does the president believe that that's a useful source of language for his speech? And what does it say about the audience, perhaps, listening on their radios in homes throughout America? And then what does the invoking of these religious themes and religious images do for the president as he responds to his rhetorical situation? Then another way we can look at this speech is by looking at the different themes that occur throughout and the way those themes occur in pairs. We talked a little bit just briefly 
uh, a moment ago about the confidence and fear pair, but there's actually a number of those terminological pairs in the speech, ideas and images that go in contrast with one another. And so here are some of them that I think that are worth exploring a little further as you critically examine President Roosevelt's first inaugural address. You could, first of all, look at ideas related to consecration or the sacred. This is part of how Roosevelt invokes that religious temper of the address. We talked about confidence and fear as emotional balance or emotional opposites addressed by Roosevelt in the speech. You can look for the way he talks about both leadership and the exercise of power. Look at the way he addresses and names and identifies in specific terms elements related to the situation and the economic condition that America is in. Look at the image or themes related to vision and darkness and how these help us to sort of plot our position in the moral landscape of Great Depression America. And another way that he does that is to talk about the contrast between material versus moral values. So look at that theme as it occurs in the speech. Another is the contrast between truth and falsity. And look especially at what Roosevelt says regarding the false leadership of those who created the conditions from which the Great Depression has arisen. We can look at then the imagery and the metaphors related to war and the army. And this is one of the things that Suzanne Doughton focuses on in her article. Look at the contrast that Roosevelt uses between just talking about something and taking action. So this contrast of speech and action. And finally, the ideas of discipline and progress, which are prominent in the address. So you could choose actually any combination of these and gain some critical insight into the strategic choices, both linguistic and substantive, that Roosevelt makes in responding to the conditions in 1933 America. So now let's take a look at the article by Suzanne Doughton entitled Metaphorical Transcendence images of the Holy War in Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural. And Dotton notes in the opening of her article that Roosevelt had made a notation on the text of his speech, and he wrote, I sought principally in the foregoing inaugural address to banish, so far as possible, the fear of the present and of the future, which held the American people and the American spirit in its grasp, so even Roosevelt talks about this as a prominent emotional exigence for him and for the nation in the speech. Dotton goes on to say that Roosevelt's inaugural is a prime example of a speech that used familiar and reassuring combinations of metaphor to transcend a particular and recurring rhetorical problem. Roosevelt's twofold task was first to calm and then activate the American people. Either goal on its own would have been a challenge in such circumstances of national and international turmoil. Together, they presented a rhetorical dilemma of trying simultaneously to quell anxiety and inspire economic vitality. Roosevelt, I will argue, resolved this dilemma by subtly blending metaphoric clusters, religious and military, into a single integrated image of holy war. So this, in effect, is Doughton's thesis statement. Her approach to the address is to examine specifically Roosevelt's use of metaphors and the two principal metaphoric clusters that are evident in the address that of military metaphors and that of religious imagery and how they combine to create the impression or the integrated image that she describes here of a holy war. And that holy war allows him to respond to and indeed transcend the crisis of the Great Depression in the United States. She goes on to comment about what Carlin Campbell and Kathleen Jameson said regarding the presidential inaugural genre. Uh, 
how typically it included certain elements. But, Doughton observes, Roosevelt's first inaugural adds a challenging footnote to that generalization. Due to the extraordinary social and economic circumstances under which he took office, Roosevelt emphasized the need for immediate corrective action to overcome the banking crisis and begin the process of recovery from the Depression. In doing so, he enacted rather than merely promised leadership. So typically, specific actions or especially specific policy actions are not discussed in presidential inaugurals, rather more general or abstract themes. But because of the particular circumstances, Doughton notes that Roosevelt felt it was necessary to emphasize immediate corrective action to respond to the Great Depression. And to do that then, Roosevelt invokes both these military metaphors and religious ideas. As Doughton says first about the military metaphors, the military metaphors Roosevelt used up to this point in the inaugural asked his listeners to prepare themselves for an ordeal rather than promising a quick end to their economic suffering. Roosevelt told them that they could and indeed must take an active role in solving the crisis. By asking his audience to work harder with him, Roosevelt granted them a sense of control over events in their lives and led them in visualizing movement toward the ultimate goal, an easing of the economic crisis. And then she reflects on some of the values related to the religious imagery in the speech. Roosevelt encouraged pride in the national faith. He depicted the promised land, an America of the future, leading and helping other nations. America must be a holy and compassionate nation, serving as an example to others by virtue of moral action. And then she talks about how these two metaphoric clusters are combined. Although quite different at first glance, the two main metaphoric clusters in the speech serve as a powerful source of rhetorical energy when used together. The two cluster themes, religion and war, encourage listeners to produce different responses for different goals. Religion, in some pure form, if not in practice, ask for trusting, perhaps even passive acceptance of God's laws, and promises a state of peace and calm. War asks for active combat, as well as obedience to orders, and promises a state of satisfaction in victory. War, for religion's sake, or holy war, has long constituted part of our cultural vocabulary, as when we speak of someone launching a righteous crusade, the blending of military and religious voices into a holy war combines qualities of both concepts and asks listeners for unquestioning obedience and inspired committed action for a morally satisfying victory over evil, which ultimately results in peace, both spiritual and physical. So let's now take a look at the Roosevelt first inaugural. We'll listen to President Roosevelt read these excerpts himself. And we'll see in those excerpts especially some of those themes related to religion and biblical phrasing, the biblical language and paraphrase, and also the military metaphors. Here to begin is actually the typed manuscript copy of Roosevelt's inaugural address, the one from which he read on Inauguration Day. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts 
to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. And I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. So we see in this opening excerpt, especially, that famous line that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. So in this case, we want to focus especially on those emotional elements of the speech, how fear has to be balanced ultimately with this sense of confidence and how Roosevelt uses that military metaphor, which he introduces here with the conversion of retreat into advance and with the reference to what is essential to victory as one way of inspiring that confidence. And yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of locusts compared with the perils which our forefathers conquered because they believed and were not afraid, we have still much to be thankful for. Nature still offers her bounty, and human efforts have multiplied it. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and have abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. Now, here in the second excerpt, among the things I want to make sure we pay attention to is the biblical language here. We have that reference to the plague of locusts, which comes right out of the book of Exodus, the story of Moses and the plagues against Egypt. But we also have other references that a biblically literate audience would recognize, the reference to people who believed and were not afraid. And of course, this is what Roosevelt wants to inspire in the American people, a belief in themselves and one that will banish their fear. But then also in the end here, look at the reference to the unscrupulous money changers, which should call to mind for anyone familiar with the Gospels, the story of Jesus chasing the money changers out of the temple. That phrase, money changers, will immediately bring to mind a biblical context for what Roosevelt is saying. Stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow their false leadership, they have resorted to exhortation, pleading carefully for restored confidence. They only know the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision. And when there is no vision, the people perish. Yes, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truth. The measure of that restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values, more noble than mere monetary profit. Happiness lies not in the mere possession of money. It lies in the joy of achievement, in the thrill of creative effort, the joy, the moral stimulation of work, no longer must be forgotten in the mad chase of evanescent profit. These dark days, my friends, will be worth all Lake Foster if they teach us that our true destiny is not to be ministered unto, but to minister to ourselves, to our fellow men.
Now, those religious and biblical themes are obvious again in this third excerpt. So we have again that reference to vision, and when he says, when there is no vision, the people perish, there's again almost a direct quotation from the Bible. We have a reintroduction of the money changers. The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. And then in this last sentence here, these dark days will be worth all they cost us if they teach us that our true destiny is not to be ministered unto, but to minister to ourselves and to our fellow men. That not to be ministered unto, but to minister comes directly from the Gospel of Matthew and the King James Version of the Bible. If I read the temper of our people correctly, we now realize as we have never realized before our interdependence on each other, that we cannot merely take, but we must give as well. But if we are to go forward, we must move as a trained and loyal army willing to sacrifice for the good of a common discipline. Because without such discipline, no progress can be made, no leadership becomes effective. We are, I know, ready and willing to submit our lives and our property to such discipline because it makes possible a leadership which aims at the larger good. This I propose to offer pledging that the larger purposes will bind upon us, bind upon us all as a sacred obligation with a unity of duty hitherto evoked only in times of armed strife. With this pledge taken, I assume unhesitatingly the leadership of this great army of our people dedicated to a disciplined attack upon our common problems. Now in this excerpt, perhaps you heard it right away, that metaphor of the trained and loyal army undertaking a common discipline. And we see how that metaphor is combined a little further on with the religious themes introduced earlier. He talks about being bound as a sacred obligation with a unity of duty heretofore evoked only in time of armed strife. So this is the beginning of the merging of these metaphoric clusters into what Doughton refers to as the rhetoric of a holy war. Roosevelt continues with more of that military or army metaphor. I assume unhesitatingly the leadership of this great army of our people dedicated to a disciplined attack upon our common problems. I am prepared, under my constitutional duty, to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. These measures, or such other measures, as the Congress may build out of its experience and wisdom, I shall seek within my constitutional authority to bring to speedy adoption. But, in the event that the Congress shall fail to take one of these two causes, in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. <laughs> For the trust proposed in me, I will return the courage and the devotion that befit the time. I can do no less. And that military metaphor is invoked again in a very compelling passage, which in some sense actually suggests that Roosevelt was seeking what might amount to 
sort of authoritarian or even dictatorial powers as a way of addressing the Great Depression. But in the event that the Congress shall fail to take one of these two courses, and in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given to me if we were, in fact, invaded by a foreign foe. But of course, Roosevelt is not the only president to use military metaphors or war metaphors to address what is a non-military crisis or problem. We saw, for instance, President Johnson declare a war on poverty and several different administrations which were engaged in the war on drugs. You've probably noticed even that President Trump, in responding to the current pandemic, has referred to the crisis as if it is a war. And so this is a common metaphor, and Roosevelt here is using it effectively maybe even more effectively than the others because of the particular economic crisis, the Great Depression, that the United States is suffering, but also because he combines that war metaphor with the religious themes that he had introduced earlier. So that is a look at Roosevelt's first inaugural address, and I'll close here by talking about some of the practical policies that Roosevelt introduced as part of his New Deal to address the economic crisis. And one of those was the Civil Conservation Corps. And here's an iconic photograph of President Roosevelt in the lower right. The other photograph actually is of my father and one of his companions. My father is on the right. And they were serving in the Civil Conservation Corps in 1938. My father worked at what became Bear Brook State Park in New Hampshire. And so if you go to Bear Brook State Park, you can see the historical marker, which identifies the site of the Civil Conservation Corps camp uh, from 1935 to 1942. Um, and if you enjoy the park, you can thank President Roosevelt, my father, and all of the other people who worked as part of the Civil Conservation Corps. So if you have any comments or questions about the Roosevelt First Inaugural, please post them to the discussion board.